Bring you greetings from Word of Jesus Worship Center in Holbrook. Um, the saints are, are praying for me. Um, they know I'm coming back, but they're praying anyway. Um, and we've had a long-standing relationship. Pastor David and Diane have not only been mentors, but they've been friends for over 22 years. And um, for him to open up his pulpit when he's got an awesome staff just speaks of the kind of man he is. It, 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 his heart to bring the body of Christ together is awesome. Can, can we just give the Lord praise? Thank you, Jesus. Um, I, I, I just want to... I just want to thank the worship team because, do you, yeah, go ahead once again. Do you, do you know the purpose of worship, God doesn't need it. He just requests it and requires it. But the purpose of worship is to prepare you and I to receive the word. It's to get our mind off everything else and have us focus on the one we have gathered here to know just a little bit better. And, and the worship team has done a phenomenal job. You know, I, I, there are two themes running through my message this morning. And I'm so glad I asked Elder Dolores, I said, do I have a time limit? Because we, we don't have a, a prayer meeting till Tuesday night, so I, I can, you know, I don't know, do you get a lunch break? Um, there are two themes running through, and, and basically, I don't normally title messages, but some folks like a title. So at least they can write something down and then put the book away, and then they're done for the, for the day. But um, the title of today's message is Give Them What You Got. But it almost changed last evening because I, um, I had gone over my notes, and this is a message I, I, I shared with our, our congregation, so um, I'm not just, you know, picking on you. Um, I finished, I guess, around 8.30 last evening, much earlier than usual, because you start earlier, and I had to be ready. And I, 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 I was watching uh, Dr. Charles Stanley. How, how many know Dr. Stanley? seasoned, awesome man of God, um, tremendous relationship with the Lord, and the, and the word just flows out of him. And, and I watched him for a while, and then I went to bed, and within an hour, I was up, cold sweat, throwing up, and I, I'm not nervous about coming here. You, you don't scare me a bit, you know. Um, but all of a sudden, all this stuff is going on. And I'm saying, Lord, okay, and what's the first thing we do? We never give God credit. We say, it's the enemy. It's the enemy. He's just trying to wipe me out so I can't go tomorrow. Well, it may well have been the enemy, but how many know that what the enemy means for evil, God works for good, okay? So I, I believe the Lord was showing me something that, that would probably um, help us understand today. Um, sadly, sadly, most church services would be over by now, right? Well, what you come here for? You came here to worship the Lord, to be instructed in righteousness, to participate, maybe to receive. And that's, that's what we hope is on the menu this morning. Um, I, I want to share a story from a, a book entitled Harvest of Humility by John Siemens. In, in his book, he tells the story of a, a wounded German soldier who was ordered to go to a military hospital um, for treatment. And when he arrived at the large and imposing building, he saw two doors. One was marked for slightly wounded and the other for the seriously wounded. He chose the first door and found himself going down a long hallway. At the end of it, two more doors. One marked for officers, the other for enlistees. He entered through the ladder and found himself going down another long hall. At the end of it were two more doors. 
one marked for party members, the other for non-party members. He took the second door, and when he opened it, he found himself out on the street. When the soldier returned home, his mother asked him, how'd you get along at the hospital? Well, mother, he replied, to tell the truth, the people there didn't do anything for me, but you ought to see the tremendous organization they have. Is that an indictment of the Church of Jesus Christ today? Are we so intent on trying to jam so much into such little time and to attract people and be nice and give people what they appear to want rather than what Jesus said we need? I, I know of several, you know, supposedly Bible-believing churches. You know, they don't have worship. They have a song service. Three songs, sit down, take the offering, do the announcement, give you a, a 10 to 15 minute word of encouragement and turn you loose. And the best part of that service is either the bagel or the crumb cake. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad that in this day and age when we have so much access to the word of God and the move of God and the leading of his Holy Spirit, that we settle for that. We kind of jam God in like a commercial in our lives. He's in between the other two things we're doing. And we expect that we're going to see and do great and mighty exploits because our God said we would. I, I want to talk to you th this morning about, uh, about two things. Um, first of all, um, the promise we have. I'm going to be in the book of Acts this morning. So we'll, we'll start at the beginning of the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. And I'm sure you're familiar with this verse. Well, first of all, verse 5 is, is, um, is Jesus. These are really Jesus' last words, except for the book of Revelation. But these are the last things he said when he was on earth. In verse 5, he says, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Speaking to his disciples. Promising them that he wouldn't leave them comfortless, but he would send the Holy Spirit. How, how many, if this is Full Gospel Christian Center, then we believe the whole thing from cover to cover, right? 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 You all, you all have your hymn book? Everybody's got theirs? I call it a hymn book because it's all about him. Right. Jesus made that statement, and in verse 8, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and even to the uttermost or remotest parts of the earth. As we prayed for a sister who's returning to the mission field, do you understand how missions works? Everybody can't go because if everybody went, there would be none to supply. And if everybody stayed back, there'd be no one to send the supply to. So God calls some and sends them out to the mission field. And I know I know that this work supports missions because you didn't get these at a carnival, okay? These are places where the gospel has gone because of the faithfulness of God's people and the leadership in this house. And those aren't decorations, but they are a testimony to that very verse that the gospel would go forth in all those lands. Um, in, in Acts chapter 2, I want to pick it up in verse 36. Now, how many believe that promise that you will receive power Amen. when the Holy Spirit comes upon you? It's valid. It's every believer's. Now, some will say, well, when I got saved, uh, I, I received the Holy Spirit. You can't separate the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Um, others will say, well, you know, it's kind of all rolled into one. Um, there's a, a, a gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. But there is primarily a person of the Holy Spirit. Now, every one of us should have received power. Now I want to ask you an honest question. How many are frustrated at the lack of the demonstration of that power? You want more. You wish there was more. You expect, God, you got to back me up here. I'm going out. I'm stepping out on your word. I, I, I need you to follow through. But we're frustrated, and I believe there's a reason. I believe there's a reason we're frustrated, and, and, and we're going to look at it. Um, picking up in um, verse 36 of chapter 2, Peter said to them, and here's, here's the first key or the first theme in this message today. He says, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How many have given their life to Christ? How many have been baptized as an adult? Okay, you understand that that's the next step is your public declaration of your faith in Christ and your willingness um, to, to live for him. All right. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off. That includes us. And as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Do you think his generation was any more perverse than ours? Do you think it's gotten better or has it gotten worse? Worse. 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 Look how fast it's happening. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Just a simple message, not a profound prophetic utterance, but a simple message. Repent. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. Do, do you understand that word repentance? So often we, we have taken repentance, and, and I think... The Lord gave me a, a physical illustration last night because I had all ends going and was sweating, and, and I was in a cold sweat and a hot sweat, and I had no idea what had caused it. Um, but I kept asking the Lord, well, you know, wh wh what does it mean? What, what's happening here? So many of us see repentance as a hamper full of dirty clothes, and I repent, and I throw that in there, too. Now the hamper's full, but I repented. But did you repent? Have you thought about repentance? Do you understand what repentance is? Repentance is an about face. It's turning from where you were going and what you were doing to where he is and what he wants you to do. And it's ongoing. It's a process. It's not an event. It is a process. Because how many know we're creatures of habit? And you can get on your knees, you can weep, you can get before God and say, Lord, I'll never do that again. And how many know the enemy knows our Achilles heel? He knows just how to find you and I. Knows just where we are, and he knows just when. And you say, but I don't look at that stuff. But when you're flipping channels, what comes on? And so you linger. You know, what, repentance is a turning away. It's a rejection of. And because, because we failed to fully repent, we don't have the full operation of the Holy Spirit because no man can serve two masters. It, it takes a concentrated effort, not just Sunday mornings or Wednesday evenings. It's a, it's a lifetime process and commitment because then, then will the power of the Holy Spirit be relieved, released in men and women. 
boys and girls. I've heard of so many testimonies of ministries, ministries where they couldn't get adults saved, but children were getting saved. They were using the children to pray for people, and they're getting healed. Why? Because of that innocence and those children totally committed and loving the Lord Jesus and going out. And if they read it, they said it, it happened. It happened. You know, um, unless we become like children, you know, unless we retrieve that innocence, and it's through repentance. Listen, this isn't a feel-good message but it's going to make you good. It's going to help you step into the fullness of what God has for you. And it doesn't matter how many people or how many chairs are in this place. If you will receive and apply the word of God, you will begin to see that Holy Spirit work through you and go well beyond where you thought your limits were. Get excited because God has some things in, in store for you. Um, does anybody remember where I stopped? Oh, uh, right. So we'll pick it up in 40. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then all those who had received his word were baptized, and that day 3,000. Okay. Now look at, at verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Okay? Those are four key ingredients to an effective, spirit-filled church. Amen. Four things. Let me, let me just elaborate a little bit on those four things. They were hearing the apostles' teaching. What, what does that mean? Well, they, all they had was Old Testament. New Testament wasn't wasn't printed yet but the scriptures unfold God's plan for our lives and details the blessings that accompany obedience to his word obedience is the key the only thing you you can read the scriptures you can memorize them you can take them apart you can go to the original languages the only thing God blesses is obedience obedience I'm a product of a parochial education, 15 years, Chaminade High School, St. John's University. Listen, we were taught more than academics, okay? We, we, we were instructed in righteousness. We were taught character issues. You know, we were taught patience. Wait, it's not your turn. I still go to the bathroom at 315. You know, that was my turn. They, they programmed us. And honestly, I, I do still have a fear of penguins, but um, um, I'll get over that, I, I, I've been told. W.C. Fields went to visit his attorney. I don't know if you're old enough to remember W.C. Fields, but he went to see his attorney. The man was sitting there at his desk. He had his Bible open, and W.C. Fields said to him, he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm reading my Bible. He said, oh, looking for loopholes, eh? <laughs> you know, that's the way some people perceive it. They don't see this as the instruction manual for human beings. They don't see this as our guide to get closer to our creator and to each other. They don't see it as a pathway to joy and peace and love because of a relationship we have with our Savior. All right, the second thing was fellowship. Learning and working together so we may grow in his word and his ways. I, I learned a long time ago from a, a very seasoned godly man who happened to stay at our home while he was ministering on the island. And he told us, he said, you minister to weakness, you fellowship with strength. That's key. We think everything is fellowship. It isn't. There are times when you're called upon to tell somebody the truth. And it may cost you a relationship, or they may recoil, or they may come back at you. Not that you lord it over them, 
But you have, we have to speak the truth in situations. You can't stroke uh, folks when, when, you know, when they're, they're, they're heading down a wrong path. You're responsible to give them good, godly instruction. You fellowship with strength when you find it. You minister to weakness. It's that simple. Um, uh, the, you know, the scriptures tell us not to forsake the fellowshipping of, of ourselves together. Now, wh what is fellowship? We could get a whole bunch of different definitions. But anybody here go camping? Have we got any campers? Okay, any form of scouts or whatever? When... When you go camping and you light a campfire and that thing is really cooking, you can take the hottest log off that campfire and set it aside. And that fire will keep going. That log will go out. We need each other. We need that constant interaction of receiving and exchanging and imparting to one another. If you come to church, sit by yourself, leave by yourself, you might catch a nugget here and there, but you're missing a golden opportunity to be part of the body of Christ and to be used and to have you, your gifts and talents cultivated and drawn on. And, to have, and you miss the ability of someone else to speak into your life because, well, I'm nobody true but you're a somebody about to happen right. all you got to do is show up 90 percent of christianity is just showing up it's not how much you memorize i knew i knew a man we visited my in-laws in florida and i knew a man who memorized the new testament but he didn't live it i wasn't impressed he was a, a, a bible teacher in his church but he didn't live it it didn't mean, it didn't have any significance um, to him. Um, the breaking of bread, sharing your blessings with others for the mutual encouragement, edification, and connecting of the body of Christ. It's every joint supplying. When you're not there, something's missing. You're necessary. Otherwise, God would have called you home already. He would have been done with you. I, I've, often, I've often asked that question. Um, how, how many believe Jesus saved us just to go to heaven? Come on up here. We'll send you now. You know? No, nobody takes me up on that one. No, nobody wants to, you know, nobody wants to go yet. We want to be ready. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But no, nobody responds to that altar call. Um, the, the, the purpose of the, of the breaking of bread is to remind us of whose we are, not who we are. So much is focused. So much is focused on you and how wonderful you are and how God sees you so marvelously and wonderfully. And how did he ever get along without you? What did he do before you got here? You know, we... It, 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 it's a wrong emphasis and a wrong focus. And lastly, and if you can't say amen, say ouch. But prayer, prayer, prayer. What's the least attended function in the church? Prayer. We only need two to agree. I guess they're there. I'm not going. The most important and probably the least practiced of the four, it's not telling God what you think you want or need. It's listening to what God wants from you. That's the purpose of prayer is finding out, God, open up your plan. Lord, show me. Father, where do I need work? What, what, let, me, let me climb up on the wheel, and, and, and you continue to shape and mold me. What do you want to do with me, Lord? How can I be more effective for you? How can you use me to win others, to help others? I'm telling you, there's going to be a release today of, of Holy Spirit power because he promised, not because we deserve it or, or, or are entitled to it, but because he promised, and he's not a man that he could lie. Um, 
I, I wrote this down. I'll read it to you because this is how the Lord said it to me. But I, I said, thanks to your committed pastors and leaders here at Full Gospel Christian Center. These key ingredients are in operation along with many others. But I believe the Lord has sent me to caution you as a body of believers and to reassure you that everything you need is available to you right here and right now. That some of you are thinking, well, that's, that's a more seeker-friendly church. Well, I heard that, you know, um, uh, they, they do serve the bagels before service, and, uh, and they do have, you know, the, the Keurig thing, and um, you can get a cup of coffee, and you can even bring it into the sanctuary. You, you can stop thinking about what you're missing here and get on board here. Get on board here. If something isn't happening, it's because you're disobedient. I mean, we've had more families come into our church and say, do you have this, 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 and that? I said, no, but you're welcome to any one of them. You want to? Come on. Well, I'll give you an office. You know, just help us do this. Help us serve. You know, everybody wants to come and be treated like the Queen of Sheba. It doesn't work like that. But everybody has a part. And everybody is necessary. And let me tell you, this is an awesome work of God. And it can be so much more awesome, and so can you. Jesus didn't come to earth to start an organization. That's why I read, read you about the, you know, the German hospital. Um, Jesus didn't come to form an organization. Neither did he come to make bad people good. A lot of folks will tell you that. Well, Jesus came, you know, to... Um, gather sinners and, and to make bad people good. He had one purpose when he came. He came to make dead people live. That, that was the reason Jesus showed up on this planet. So he entrusted them with the responsibility to go into all the world and make disciples. And some 2,000 years later, that mission statement has not changed and neither has its focus. It's Jesus, not you and me. The focus is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. It is him. He's the reason we gather. He's the reason we assemble. He's the reason we have an anchor into e eternity. Um, Acts chapter 3. And I've enlisted the aid um, of my brother and friend for many years, Alan Jones. Alan, would you just come and sit here? And I, I'm going to go over Acts chapter 3, the first 10 verses. You just have a seat there. And, um, and John and I are going to come up to the temple. But it says, Acts chapter 3. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. Why were they going? The hour of prayer. They were going to hear what God had to say to them. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. Hmm. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. What's he looking for? Money. Money so he can get some bread this evening, so he can have a meal. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. How much you got in there? Listen, I, you got, have you got $10? I, I got a book, Your Best Life Now, will really help you. Really going to do wonders for you. I'll tell you what, let me ask John. John, you're about to write three epistles. Why don't you get his email? And, and, and see, see, maybe you could send those to him. What's the guy looking for? Money. Is that what he needs? Well, it is in a sense. But is that really his greatest need? No. Because, um, uh, and, and he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, silver and gold, I don't have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, 
walk. So get up, go sit down, and let me get on with this message. Oh, you can hold that till later. Thanks. What happens, th thanks, Alan. Um, what happens is we perceive a need, and then we ask God, okay. And we go over and we force ourselves on somebody. But we don't bother to stop and ask God, Lord, what's the underlying need? What's going on here? That's where prayer comes in. Lord, do you believe God speaks to people today? I do. I do. I spoke to him this morning. God talks to his children. It isn't a problem with God not speaking. It's a problem with us not listening. If you will take the time and before you jump in to the pool, if you will consider what Peter is about to say, and that's why he gave us these ribbons. All right. What, what Peter did, he seized him by the right hand, picked him up, and he said, in the name of Jesus the Nazarene, walk. Well, this guy was pretty excited. He got up, he walked, his legs were made straight. Remember, he was lame from birth a creative miracle. And what did he do? He latched on to Peter and John and wouldn't let go. And he went with them. And into the temple they went. And, and it continues. Um, uh, verse 11, while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this, or why do you gaze at us, if by your own power of piety we had made him walk? You think we've got what it takes to do that? No, but it is inherent in us. There is a Holy Spirit residing in you and I that is so anxious to be released. Why? For God's glory. Not so you and I could start a healing ministry. And not everybody's got that. Years ago, I was blessed, really blessed, um, to, for a season, have an anointing to pray for childless couples. And for whatever reason, God miraculously opened wombs. It went on for about three or four years, and that was the end of that season. That was it. I don't know if it's because we have seven children, 12 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. I, I, I don't, we didn't give any instruction. I don't think they needed it, okay? But we prayed for them. My wife and I prayed for them and got calls back. I dedicated most of those children. And that was awesome for that season. But I know it wasn't me. In fact, I got in trouble in our church on one occasion. Um, well, now he's, now he's 16. But um, an elder in our church, his son came to visit um, uh, for Father's Day. And um, he came, oh no, they came before Father's Day and we were dedicating a child. And I sensed the Lord saying, go and ask the mother to bring that child over to that woman and um, I asked her if she wants to hold it. So I went to the mom, I said, go ask Heidi if she'd like to hold your son. She kind of looked at me funny, I said, it's all right. And I, I watched, and she took the child gladly and was holding it, and I, I knew the Lord spoke. So I went over and I said, Heidi, if you can believe it, this time next year, you'll be holding your own child. Well. The two of us kind of choked. My wife gets me aside. She said, what is the matter with you? I said, what do you mean? Thank God for wives, you know. I said, what do you mean? She says, they've been to every fertility clinic and every place. They can't have children. I said, do you think God knows that? They came, they came on Father's Day because our elder was speaking, bringing the Father's Day message. And we didn't expect to see him again. But they were back several months later. And Elder Jim says to me, uh, 
David and Heidi want to talk to you. I said, I'm in for it now. He said to me, uh, Pastor, the doctor just confirmed that Heidi's pregnant. He said, he said, her due date is, and he gave me the date, and he says, that's two days before the anniversary of when you told her this time next year. I said, what does that tell you, David? He says, my baby's going to be two days early. <laughs> you know, he, he just had it figured out. They are now elders in training in our church. Um, but God, God knows what he wants to do. Um, I want to caution you because I, I do want to pray for you. We're going to do a general prayer of repentance. And then if anyone wants to stay, and, and I'll pray for the release of that gifting in you so you can know your gift and you can know how to use it and you can fill in and you can be a support to this work. You can be used of God, not only in the church, because it's, it's easy to function in church. It really is. It's when you get out there that you hit the opposition. That's when, you, that's when you're in the trenches and when you gotta be ready. And that's when you gotta be even more Christ-like, even more loving, even more turn the other cheek. You know, you've got to not give folks what they want, but ask God, what do they need? Right. You deliver the need, God will take care of the rest. But here's the caution, be careful. Tr please, please, please don't be envious of somebody else's gift. That'll get you into so much trouble. I was sitting in a pastor's office upstate New York, a good friend of mine, and he was telling me how a man came into his office. Under his arms were plans, and he sat down. He said, Pastor, you um, renovated the supermarket and made it a church, but you got all this nice land next door. He says, I really want to build a church in this town. He says, I've already paid an architect. I've got the plans. He says, and I will give you a half a million dollars to construct a post and beam church. It'll seat 200, Pastor Bob said. I was hoping, I think I'd rather do 250. He says, okay, then you build it. He said, no, 200 will be fine. Well, I was in that church recently, but as I sat in his office, I said, God, why wouldn't you give me a half a million dollars? <laughs> Fair, right? I'd no sooner formulated the question in my head when the Lord said, son, I already did. It repented immediately. I had to repent immediately because a very quick tally, our, our little 10,000 square foot facility in Holbrook on Lincoln Avenue, the man who sold us the building held the mortgage. We have not, we're there 25 years this month. We have not been able to make a full mortgage payment since we bought the building 25 years ago. That man has written off amounts every year in the, in the tens of thousands, okay? And most recently for our 25th anniversary, I gave the church an accounting. We're up to 825,000 in forgiven debt. That's the same as income, folks. That's the same as income. But God has a work there, and he's doing something. It's not about us. We, honestly, we will never own that building. If Jesus doesn't come back for a 1,000 years, we'll still be paying if we're here, all right? We're never going to own it, but we're using it for his honor and glory. But the thing is, you got to know what God wants from you. All right, let me, let me just continue because I don't want to keep you all day. Um, Let's, let's pick it up after that, after that miracle. Um, in verse 11, while he was clinging to Peter and John, the people ran together. All right, he skipped that. Um, he, he lights into them in verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and dis disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. He's given him a quick history. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. The purpose of that man's healing 
was to be a demonstration and an opportunity for Peter to speak to the Jewish people how they missed it, how they missed their Messiah. And, and how they, were, they, they got caught up in the mob mentality and said, crucify him. He says, um, and now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance. Some of us act in ignorance. Most of us, many of us. Some of us sometimes and many of us all the time. But we do. We just don't know any better because we haven't applied ourselves to learn what this word is all about. Just as your rulers did also, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled. And verse 19 is again a powerful promise. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord, you will flow freely in your gifts. If you're not all jammed up, if your circuits aren't full of unrepentant acts, Times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Worship invites the presence of Almighty God. And the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth, but he'll also remind us of those things we may have overlooked. Here's another caution. Be very careful because the enemy has an excellent record of your and my deportment. Okay, and he will come. If you're open, he will come, and he'll say, remember when you did that, Rich? Remember? It was, okay, it was 1967, but remember? You know, and he'll come. And you know what? I used to re-repent for the things that the devil was telling me about. But I, I stopped because the Lord said to me, just thank me that that's under the blood. You repented. I forgave. You didn't. It hasn't happened since 1973. So let's leave it alone. Just know when you are reminded of something, know that there's a faithful God who when he says he casts his, it, as far from him as east is from west and he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness, the Holy Ghost comes and puts up a sign, says no fishing, and that's the end of that. That's the end of that. Thank you, Jesus. But you, if you have genuinely repented, it's done, it's over, it's nailed to the cross, it's gone. But repentance is key, my brothers and sisters. So if you would, just stand and let's, I'm going to just pray a general prayer of, of repentance and ask, and ask that you would be open to listen to that still small voice of the Lord. His love overtakes any of our stupidity, any of our foolishness, any of our misgivings. Father, repentance is the key to a restored relationship with you and a full outpouring of your Holy Spirit and a full release of the power that you promised. Lord, I pray as a people who just, who aren't satisfied with trying, but really genuinely want to be closer to you. Lord, we repent of past and present acts, thoughts, um, uh, uh, things we may have said. Oh, God, forgive us. Lord, we repent. Put just put a check in our spirit that we would choose our words carefully for someday we might have to eat them. Lord, help us to, to turn from the wicked ways that keep snaring and pulling us and getting us into trouble. Father God, I just release a sense of true, genuine repentance and turning, turning in a different direction so that your people may walk. They may stand uprightly. They may walk with their face set like a flint towards you that they may, Lord God, be able to see and sense a release of your wisdom, your understanding, your gifting, your power. 
we thank you for that in Jesus' precious name.